there are countless ways to fulfill the same set of needs. Especially if those requirements are off-road capability, everyday comfort, and practicality. And today, I have three distinct options that meet that criteria. So which one is the best? When I say distinct, I mean it. Each of these are unicorns in their own way. The Subaru Outback is a value-minded, lifted wagon. The Toyota 4Runner is a body-on-frame SUV built to outlast its owners. And the Ridgeline... I, I don't think the Ridgeline knows what the Ridgeline is, but nonetheless, it's a well-thought-out, unique vehicle. And for its size, it's priced pretty well. Each of these vehicles do overlap slightly in price, with the Toyota 4Runner demanding the most amount of money. As for the Subaru, I'm going to be focusing on the turbocharged model. But remember, if you don't mind highway passing maneuvers taking a business day or two, the naturally aspirated version is the value champ here. Dimensionally, while the Ridgeline is much longer than the other two, these are more similar than you might think, and they offer similar features too. If you want more details on an individual model, I'll link my reviews below. Since they're adventurous, they're not only going to have LED headlights, they'll have LED fog lights as well. The Outback and 4Runner also offer some flavor of front camera, whereas the Ridgeline only has one in the rear and it has the picture quality of Bigfoot footage. However, while each of the cars here have a clever trick or two, the Honda is the most useful. First, we have their dual action tailgate, which reveals a huge trunk. Plus, this has a drain hole, so you can use it as a cooler or a swimming pool. This is also a composite bed as standard, so there's no need to line it. There's eight tie-down points to help you make the best use of its five-foot length. But if you fold it down, <laughs> it's not dampened. You have nearly seven feet, but the other cars have something hidden to offer as well. The Forerunner's rear window can actually roll down electronically and the Subaru Outback comes with deployable crossbars on every model except for the Wilderness, which instead opts for rails that can support more weight for things like a rooftop tent. This Wilderness model also comes with a comprehensive list of upgrades for off-roading, including increased ground clearance that actually puts it in line with the four-wheel drive 4Runner. When it comes to swagger, I do like the cartoonish look of the Outback, but the 4Runner's crisp and boxy design has aged well. So for style, that's my choice but let me know your thoughts. Briefly, I'd like to thank the kind people over at Royal South Toyota and Royal on the East Side for letting me test drive several Outbacks and Forerunners over the years. The staff are friendly, Royal is dedicated to the community, and both their Outbacks and Forerunners are currently discounted. Check them out. These also contrast one another on the inside. The Honda is categorized by simplicity, plush rest points, and enough storage to challenge your memory. Legitimately, I've forgotten where I've put things because there are so many cubbies. Honda's magic back seat is a game changer too, for both hauling large items and storing long stuff underneath. And these seats are debatably the most comfortable here. They're soft, supportive, well-shaped, and the controls aren't frustrating. Most use physical inputs, some of which are pretty satisfying. There's quite a bit of plastic in here, but the construction of everything, the panel fitment is reassuring. Plus, for 2024, Honda updated the Ridgeline with their current infotainment system that feels fresh enough, has a quick response time, solid resolution, and standard wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. The only downside is that it occasionally won't connect. Something some have reported with the Subaru as well. I'm also not that impressed with the sound system. The treble can struggle at the high volumes. My subwoofer rattles a little bit. The Black Edition will add a few more speakers and more power, so maybe that'll improve things. But really, so long as you skip the bass, you're gonna have leather upholstery, a sunroof, along with heated front seats. So at 44 grand, I think you're getting a lot for your money. You're also getting a lot of space for your cash. The cabin is wide and airy feeling. Sitting by myself at six foot three, I am short on legroom, but I do have good thigh support, just enough headroom, and each car here comes standard with console vents. And we can't forget, when it comes to cargo, the ability to throw dirty or bulky items into the bed is a big leg up for the Ridgeline. And if you were wondering, dimensionally, this should fit four by eight sheets of whatever, so long as you're comfortable hanging it out the back or using ratchet straps.
the Forerunner with the seats folded is a force to be reckoned with. In fact, it has more space than the confusing new Sequoia. You can also get it with a small third row if you'd like too. It's also the only one here with a thoughtful 40-20-40 split rear row. And below the Toyota, you will find a full-size spare tire on each model. While it does have a legroom advantage over the Honda, the body-on-frame construction does come with some limitations as it raises the floor. You have to climb into it more than the others, but the rear seat is still adult friendly. Moving up front, the Forerunner also claims simplicity as a strong suit, but it takes build quality and manliness to a whole nother level. Your view outward, the size of the knobs, buttons, and levers, they all make me want to start a brewing company or load creatine. There's a satisfying thunk to the gated shifter, something that you will never get with the buttons of the Honda. There's even a manual four-wheel drive shift lever on the TRD Off-Road and Pro, plus the panel fitment and construction of everything feels rock solid to a degree that the Subaru and Honda can't compete with. Everything in the interior is easy to understand, including the dated infotainment system that has an unimpressive resolution, just okay response time, and wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Because of that high floor, thigh support isn't particularly amazing, but the soft seats come with lumbar adjustment as standard like the rest here, and I think most people should find these agreeable. There's also great storage up front, but it's still old school. There's no digital dash, head-up display, or power rear tailgate offered. At least all of its sound systems outperform the Hondas. Here inside the Outback, it is technologically confused. Despite making a touchscreen the center of attention, it's a slow unit that feels dated by today's standards. I am happy that not all of the climate controls are embedded in the screen, and it deserves credit for being simply laid out with wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but I hope Subaru does an overhaul of this system sometime soon. The cabin is also adorned with plenty of soft touch materials. They're present where your elbows and knees rest, along with parts of the dash. And the seats themselves are reasonably plush, but well shaped. Let's go with the limited or touring, and the driver's side will have a tall person friendly thigh extension. Each of these have good visibility, but the Outback's relation to the Legacy sedan makes it feel the most approachable. Despite providing providing the most comfortable and spacious back seat. And because it's a wagon, the cargo area is long, with convenient seat releases too. It might not have the sheer height of the Forerunner or a composite bed like the Ridgeline, but for families, the Outback is hard to beat, and it shows up to win on the road as well. Under the hood is a 2.4 liter turbocharged Boxer 4. On paper, it makes 260 horsepower, a good amount of torque, but in the real world, with a vehicle that weighs under 4,000 pounds, it is potent. The mid-range passing power is by far the best here. Really, the only thing keeping this from being an amazing powertrain is the CVT transmission. Now, it's not that this is a poorly tuned version. In fact, with the naturally aspirated engine, I think it's a great fit because there's not a whole lot of power and it's responsive. It keeps the engine from feeling bogged down. That allows the 2.5 to feel up to the task of motivating the Outback. But when you combine a little bit of turbo lag with continuously changing gear ratios, you get plenty of passing power that doesn't feel linear or natural. I'd love to see Subaru develop an eight speed automatic for this engine to increase refinement. Regardless, it can get to 60 in under six seconds. With the standard powertrain, you're looking at around nine. And no matter the trim, it's always getting the power to the ground through a full-time all-wheel drive system that can send well over 50% of torque to the rear or the front. It typically resides around a 60-40 split and the system utilizes equal length drive shafts to improve balance further. And each model has 8.7 inches of ground clearance. And to help you use all of that is X mode, which among other things uses the brakes to stop spinning wheels and redirect power to the side with more grip. Once it's spooled up, passing is 
effortless at virtually any speed. And even up at 65 miles per hour, this is a quiet car. Wind noise is kept down, tire noise also blends into the background, though less so with the more aggressive tires of the Wilderness, which adds a comprehensive list of upgrades, including changes to the spring rates and shocks that allow this to have more suspension travel, and an increased ground clearance to 9.5 inches, which will have it breathing on the neck of the Forerunner. Plus, there's a more aggressive final drive ratio, which also helps it feel even more responsive, but helps for crawling off-road, and there's increased underbody protection. This thing is among one of the most capable crossovers you can buy for going off-road over the most tattered road that I'm willing to drive these cars on, any Outback is smooth. Even the wilderness here absorbs the small to medium-sized imperfections with little fuss. Large potholes barely work their way into the cabin. The ride remains stable. Even going over bumps one after another, there's no sense of jitteriness. This is among the most comfortable vehicles that you can buy for under 50 grand. Throwing it around corners, this is confident. Hit bumps midway through and it's barely bothered. As you bring it up to higher speed, you begin to feel some of the negative effects to its forgiving ride quality. It doesn't react near as quick as something like a Subaru Crosstrek. Body roll is certainly present, but it's far from overwhelming. And I would still label it as car-like. It changes direction without much fuss. In fact, the steering ratio is still pretty quick. The steering itself is light. It's very easy to drive, though it is completely numb with little bit of vagueness there on center. So I don't really see this even with the paddle shifters <laughs> bringing any amount of entertainment to your back road drives, but it does feel lighter on its feet than the others here. And part of the reason why they were able to get away with making a vehicle this forgiving without making it handle like a complete boat is that flat engine orientation and its inherent low center of gravity. Something that the other vehicles here have to fight more against, especially the Forerunner. If the Subaru is a well-priced memory foam mattress, the Toyota 4Runner is a waterbed. It's dated, there are some inherent drawbacks, yet it's surprisingly comfortable and long-lasting. Its 4-liter V6 and 5-speed automatic feel old. While it mostly works in the background, it's not quite as refined as many other modern automatics. The V6 does have some grunt when it's in its power band, but its lack of gear ratios makes it hard for this to get there. As a result, this brute can feel out of breath at times, but on a good day, this can get to 60 miles per hour in under eight seconds. So by no means would I label it lethargic, just nowhere near as spry as an Outback XT. The four liter V6 actually does an okay job at low RPM, and I really don't have any complaints with passing power, but that's not why you're buying a four runner. While four wheel drive is an option, this is the best car here for off-roading hands down. Part of that is due to the increased wheel articulation that you're gonna get with the solid rear axle. And you'll also have standard underbody protection, 9.6 inches of ground clearance on every four wheel drive model and superior approach and departure angles. And if you go with the TRD Off-Roader Pro, you'll have a locking rear differential, which takes things beyond the X mode in the Subaru Outback. And this is also the only vehicle here with a two-speed transfer case to make for the best crawl ratio. Every single four-wheel drive model will come with A-Track 2, which functions similarly to Subaru's X mode. Toyota even offers a selectable full-time 4x4 system with the limited trim that uses a limited slip center differential so you can engage the front axle in a wider variety of situations without damaging anything. There's even more stuff to too, that I won't get into now. While the Subaru Outback, especially in wilderness form, might take most people to every camping spot they'd ever dream of, the Forerunner will do it with ease and less stress, and it'll get you to where you need to go in comfort. Going around rough corners in the Forerunner, it feels clumsy but secure. And this is actually the limited trim, which 
gives it the x Riaz suspension. It diagonally links the shock absorbers, which does actually improve the body roll without sacrificing comfort. I've driven virtually every version of this generation, and all of them are comfortable over roads like this. Even repeated bumps, they don't really torment this thing near as much as they did in the now previous generation Toyota Tacoma. And it feels even less bothered by potholes. Granted, it's nowhere near as poised as the Subaru Outback, especially with the softer TRD off-road suspension. While that x Riaz does reduce body roll, there's no getting around how hefty this thing feels on a back road. Go with like the TRD off-road or the SR5, and the brake dive can be occasionally concerning. As long as you don't drive like a madman, the Forerunner is fine on a winding road. But no matter how you look at it, it's big pirate ship steering wheel, body roll, and slow ratio will make this feel clumsy in comparison to the Outback and the Ridgeline. Of the three, the Honda Ridgeline is the most eclectic here. You have an engine that screams like an old school Honda with a 5,500 RPM VTEC changeover. It also has the utility of a mid-sized truck and the road manners of a minivan. Under the hood is a 3.5 liter naturally aspirated V6. It traces its roots back to the 90s, but it's gone through several iterations. Today, it's paired up with a smooth shifting nine-speed automatic. It allows for pretty seamless takeoffs as well. And so long as you're not in its economy mode, it's pretty good at kicking down to the right gear which is a necessity due to its power band. Nonetheless, it's rated to tow 5,000 pounds, and there's plenty of Ridgeline owners saying that it does this without much drama. The Forerunner has an identical rating, and each allows you to manually select gears if the need arises. The Honda has an efficiency advantage on the archaic Forerunner, but both of them will cost more to fuel than any Outback. It not only has good passing power, it has good throttle response. And once we're there at 65 miles per hour, the revs are just a hair above 1500 RPM. Tire noise with the all terrains of the trail sport is barely present. Wind noise is kept down with its acoustic windshield that you'll find on most trims. Really, all three of these vehicles perform well on the highway. Despite a slight hesitation off the line, the Ridgeline can scramble to 60 in just 6.8 seconds with zero wheel spin because the iVTM all-wheel drive system is extremely responsive. While it can operate as front-wheel drive, it can also send up to 70% of torque to the rear wheels. This was not intended to help with zero to 60. Instead, this was to help perform better on snow and ice or off-road. It also has proper torque vectoring through the rear differential. And for 2024, Honda has introduced the Trail Sport to the Ridgeline. This is a trim that tunes the spring rates dampening and the sway bars to increase articulation and make it more comfortable off-road. Also important are the General Grabber all-terrain tires to further enhance your traction. I just took a Passport Trail Sport which is very similar to this, over a few obstacles, and I was impressed. But because this is still based on an old pilot, articulation and off-road angles are still not great. This does have an oil pan skid plate, so at least you shouldn't suffer catastrophic damage with your just 7.9 inches of ground clearance. But really, this is still a vehicle for the road that is now a little bit better adapted to go off-road, only its changes were not as comprehensive as what was done to the Outback. Bring the Ridgeline up to more speed around corners and body roll is certainly noticeable this is not eager to turn in but for its heft and height it's comfortable on a back road the steering while it is numb actually doesn't feel as vague on center as the subaru and even though it feels heavier maybe there's a little bit more body motion because of how direct it is and the slight build up and weight as you go through corners i think this actually feels more natural pair that up with this power band and really this is the most entertaining vehicle to drive here. On the same appalling road, the Honda Ridgeline is much more smooth than the other mid-sized trucks I've driven. It's forgiving, just like the Outback, but you feel the large impacts a little more here than in the other two. At least it retains its composure better than the Toyota, and over most roads, especially on the highway, comfort is great.
the Forerunner is one of the most reliable vehicles you can buy. I'll keep things brief today, but the most expensive common problem is the x riaz suspension leaking prematurely. We also have had some since resolved issues with the fuel pump, lock actuators, and rear diff groaning. And since its engine is the only one here to be port injected, carbon buildup shouldn't be a worry. The Honda and the Subaru are by no means unreliable. In fact, I would still recommend either to people that prioritize longevity, especially the Honda, the V6 and nine speed automatic have been pretty good for the Ridgeline. It has very high owner satisfaction rates, but there have been quite a few little miscellaneous electronic issues, woes with the fuel system and brakes, but nothing too crazy. Initially with the Subaru Outback, there was a powertrain control module issue that caused some transmissions to fail. There were also many reports of easily cracking windshields, buggy infotainment, and coolant bypass failure with the 2.5 liter. Both that and the PCM problem should no longer affect new models. And when it comes to your own longevity, none of these perform exceptionally in the IIHS crash test, but the Outback is the only one to earn a top safety pick. The Ridgeline and the Forerunner are a little bit more dated, so you would expect them to be a bit behind the times. That remains true with the driver assistance. All three of these will come with autonomous braking, adaptive cruise control, lane departure prevention, but the Forerunner does not have lane centering, lending one last advantage to the Subaru and Honda. As with most comparisons, picking a winner for yourself involves a deep dive into your own priorities. But objectively, some cars are more well-rounded than others, and in today's case, that vehicle is the Subaru Outback. It's the most maneuverable here. It comes with great ride quality, excellent passing power with the turbo, big passenger space, numerous features, and respectable off-road prowess too, all at the lowest price here. That said, I find the Honda Ridgeline to be the most charismatic, clever, and versatile, with its rev-happy V6, smooth 9-speed, ingenious storage solutions, and composite bed. It also somehow manages to be the most energetic entertaining to drive without sacrificing comfort. Its appeal might be more limited, but I was more impressed with the Honda than the Subaru. For my personal choice, the Forerunner still takes the edge. It is a chore to park or whip around a back road. The acceleration is just okay and the gas mileage is troublesome, but every time I drive one, I get the sensation that it's overbuilt. It's comfortable. It can take a bad road on the chin without a rattle. It's a big box, so it can swallow up most cargo that you need it to. The interior feels more sturdy than anything else I can think of at this price point. You can drive it anywhere and not stress about reaching your destination, and with its reputation, you don't need to worry about the miles you rack up while doing so. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like to help me sneak into the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe and hit the notification bell for more fun, detailed car content without fluff. Consider becoming a channel member for an additional podcast and to help me take this to another level. I'll catch you in the next one.